job I can possibly do. Now, there's a, a bit of a, a legend surrounding this mission with you. Um, on the launch pad, uh, you had to abort at one point. Right, that was back in June. Mm -hmm. And it, it was said that you kind of broke the tension after the abort. Talk a little bit about the situation of going through a countdown, knowing that you're about to launch for the first time, and then having something go wrong and shutting everything down. Yeah, it was interesting. We, uh, uh, in June, we were scheduled to launch, and the first time we got on board for the launch, uh, we got to T minus 20 minutes, which is the built-in hold point in the countdown. And when you come out of that hold point, you activate the backup computer. And when the commander did that on that day, the computer did not activate. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of figured we weren't going to go launch that day, but we counted down to the next milestone, which is T minus nine minutes, and held there, and the ground tried to troubleshoot the computer and eventually concluded it had just failed, and so it would need to be replaced. And so we, we scrubbed that day, and, and they changed the computer that night, and we went out the next day to try again, and this time coming out at T minus 20 minutes, uh, the commander took the computer to run, and it actually activated, <laughs> so mm -hmm. that was very good. And we got down to nine minutes, and we were holding there. And that's the last planned hold in the countdown. And there are several places you can hold after you come out of nine minutes and counting. The last place you can gracefully hold is T minus 31 seconds. And because now the computer was working, we finally got to T minus 31 seconds, the commander said, well, gang, we're going to go now unless something really bad happens. And so the engine started at seven seconds, and at about five seconds, they shut down. And I guess I said, some, at the time, I was thinking to myself, well, that must have been what he was referring to, <laughs> because we were sitting there now kind of swaying back and forth on the launch pad from the impulse of the engine start, but we weren't going anywhere. And, and uh, uh, after several minutes, I, I was looking out the wind, overhead window in the shuttle, which when you're on the launch pad is back over my shoulder, and I could still see the ground. And I, I told the guys, well, you know, I'm just the rookie here, but I thought we'd be higher than this at NECO, which stands for main engine cutoff. Normally that would happen eight and a half minutes after launch. And yeah, that kind of broke the tension, and, and the commander did a press conference after the scrub and after we were extricated from the vehicle, and, and uh, probably nobody would have known about it except he told everybody at the press conference I had said that. <laughs> and so. Yeah, that became a little bit of a tagline. So after that, um, you get back to the pad for the actual launch, and you actually get out to space. Describe the feeling of getting down <laughs> under those last holds and actually launching. Um, I think I was always surprised when we actually launched. I, you know, people would ask me, you know, was it really disappointing when you, you know, went out to the pad and you scrubbed? And, and in fact, you may know that I hold the record for most you know, for launch futility, most times climbing into a loaded orbiter with intent to fly. I don't even know what it is. It's 15 or 16 times. And I, my answer was always, no, I'm never disappointed because I go out to the pad expecting to scrub. <laughs> uh, in fact, if you look at all the things that have to work mm -hmm. on any given day in order for launch to happen, including having good weather, and you do the calculation, you would conclude that it's silly to even try because <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it'll never happen. So I was always surprised when we launched. Um, and I remember being kind of surprised that day when we actually, the engines actually lit and stayed on and, and we lifted off. So what's it like as you're, as you're lifting away from the pad, this, the feeling of all that thrust behind yeah, you? Yeah, it's, it's, it, you feel like you just got shot out of a gun when you first lift off. The solids are very powerful and it's very, very noisy mm -hmm. initially. Uh, you get a lot of reflected sound waves off of the pad surface, but as you climb out, the sound um, goes down quite a bit. Um, while you're riding the solids, which is the first two minutes, um, it shakes pretty violently, and it's actually a little bit hard to read the instruments because of how hard it shakes. And, and it builds up um, to a little bit around 3 Gs acceleration. And then after two minutes, the solids are jettisoned. Then it becomes very, very smooth and very, very quiet. The main engines are, are, are very powerful, but, th but they're very, very, very smooth running, and, and it's just a very purposeful acceleration, again, up to about 3 Gs, and that lasts another six and a half minutes or so. Now, at, at what point do you 
get the chance to kind of step back and realize that you're in space and kind of take in what's around you. Well, during the powered flight, you know, my job at least was as the flight engineer, I had responsibilities for monitoring systems and, and so I was really focused on that, not so much, well, you can't see much out the window anyway because uh, you're pointed up mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, and this is, this is pretty common and I remember um, I did it on my first mission and I've watched other people do it on their first mission. Uh, after the main engine cuts off, you're still strapped in your seat so you're not floating around immediately and, and so you don't feel zero G like you will uh, in a little while. But most people will commonly reach into their pocket and pull out a pen mm -hmm. and just let it go to prove to themselves they're really in weightlessness. Mm -hmm. um, on that flight, I remember we were pointed um, in a direction that, that basically showed dark space uh, through the front windows. But to maneuver to the first uh, burn attitude, we pitched down and as we did, the horizon of the earth rose in the forward windows. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, I'm seeing the earth from, from space. And then I remember thinking, you know, wow, <laughs> we really <laughs> made it to orbit. Well, we actually weren't in orbit yet, but <laughs> we made it to space. And, and th that's a memory that, that, you know, I think I'll always have. And y your next series of missions were, were probably uh, largely the most important you went on uh, working with Hubble. Uh, talk a little bit about the process leading up to launching Hubble and your involvement on the ground with the Hubble telescope development. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I'm in the process of, of trying to write a paper on that very thing because I think it's interesting now, particularly since the program is over, uh, to think about all of the work that you know all of the people had to do to anticipate all of the problems uh, or issues associated with trying to get Hubble in space and then subsequently service it in space. Mm -hmm. uh, in part because once we launched it, you know, in 1990, um, it wasn't going to be on the ground anymore, and so any tool that you wanted to develop and you wanted to fit check on the real telescope, you needed to do that before it launched. Mm -hmm. And procedures that you were going to develop that you weren't maybe going to use on the first mission, but you might use on a later mission, you needed to verify those on the real hardware before it launched. At the time, Hubble was the most massive and the largest payload we had ever launched using the, uh, and deployed using the robot arm. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of issues associated with that. Um, a lot of what we spend our time thinking about, and this is something I actually enjoyed, um, was, yeah, if everything works properly, you know, it's not that difficult. But what are you going to do if this happens? What are you going to do if this happens? And you have to have a plan that you have developed and verified. And the thing you worry about more than anything else, I believe, when it's time to actually go launch is what is the thing that's going to happen that you didn't think about mm -hmm. and didn't plan for. So to avoid that, you try to think of all possible things that could go wrong and what would you do if each of them went wrong. For example, there were lots of ways the robot arm could fail mm -hmm. and we had a plan for what we would do in each of those cases, including a plan for what we would do if it totally failed and we couldn't even use it. You know, How do you deploy Hubble if you can't use the arm? Mm -hmm. And I thought trying to solve problems like that was one of the more fun and, and challenging and fascinating aspects of the job. And the Hubble missions came at a time, they, they were in a context of, it was a tough time for NASA after Challenger. Um, what was it like to continue on with the space program after that? Well, it was a tough time. Um, you know, I don't want to say fortunately, but the fact that it hap the Challenger happened relatively early in the program uh, was beneficial um, because there was still so much to do and the program was still in development at some level that there wasn't a lot of talk about terminating the program. Mm -hmm. the, most of the talk was focused on how can we discover what happened and fix it and, and continue to fly. And, and as a result, I think the program was far better after Challenger in terms of you know, some of the engineering rigor, some of the ops rigor, some of the design improvements that were, were incorporated. Um, and, you know, and Hubble was an important mission at that time because it had a lot of visibility. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the downside of that was when we launched it and then found out it had a aberrated mirror, 
the visibility turned <laughs> against us because a lot of people then uh, thought of the Hubble telescope as a 24,000 pound piece of junk flying around the orbit, in orbit around the Earth.